Okay, I'm back again. Uh, for some reason, I'm uh, YouTube keeps dropping me. Um, <laughs> uh, well, the first time was my fault. The second time just altogether shut down. Um, so let's try this again. Um, we were looking at this uh, door, which is a... Uh, oh, here's everybody. Good, good. Okay. Um, and this time it picked the stream right back up. That's great. Um, so this is a, a new reclaim door slab. So I get these from my local door manufacturer. Um, I go and ask them, hey, can I look at your, you know, like reject pile? And they will, uh, here I am. And they will um, let me pick through. And they don't charge me very much, though most of them may want to charge you a little bit. This is a brand new solid like hemlock door, which is actually really beautiful. Um, this one happens to have a little bit of damage. Um, it's gotten smacked or something and it cracked the entire rail it seems so so that's not a very good thing so yeah look for damage um that uh in that case i would have to like cut out that piece and repair the entire door or just use it for a tabletop or something weird like that um anyway reclaim doors uh hanging a door and having it operate properly is really difficult so um it's not impossible but there's so many adjustments that usually have to be made when you hang a door uh, that doesn't fit the, you know, if the frame that you put in the house can be sized to the door, then you're getting somewhere. But if you are buying a reclaim door to put in a hole, unless your hole is absolutely standard, you'll probably still have to adjust it a little bit. And that often means taking a saw and cutting the bottom or the side even to adjust the door to the right dimensions. And when you do that, you may have to redo the hinge routes. You know, so there's a lot of steps that happen when you recut doors. Um, so, uh, again, my advice, if you're a do-it-yourselfer, is to use a pre-hung door. And what that means is it's a door that comes with its hinges in the frame already. And that saves you a jillion steps, especially if you're building new. Um, so you build your hole to it, it, there's, it's called a rough opening to allow for the size of the frame to fit in freely. It can't jam in there, it's got to be free. Um, and, but you can get standard rough opening information from any building supply. Um, I mean, they'll, if you say, I want a 36 inch door, what's the rough opening? They'll tell you. And I will give you a link to standard rough openings when, uh, when I go back and uh, the video gets processed. So, so as soon as I get done with this live stream, the, it's weird, the, the, the chat comments kind of drop off after a little while, and the YouTube processes, and um, then uh, then they put it back up. Um, so, so at first I can't do any edits, and then, then I can put links on it. Actually, I can put links on it right away, I think. It's, it's the other stuff that I can't mess with until later. So um, they just have to churn the video into the various forms that YouTube needs to... Um, let it be out in the world. Uh, okay, so enough about YouTube. It's, it's weird stuff to deal with um, being carpenter. So, uh, doors. Um, let's go look at some door frames because I've got uh, some right here. Um, well, actually, I'm going to show you this door. Uh, it's a Dutch door. Um, we are waiting to hang glass in it. Um, there's a stained glass window for it, but this is the this is Dutch door in two parts. Dutch door is uh, where a door is basically cut down the middle and you latch the top to the bottom half with a special little bolt latch. Um, and Dutch doors are a little complicated. You have to overdo the hinges. So everybody loves these kind of fancy doors, but um, they're, they add a bit of time and trouble to them. So I don't, don't advise making one if you haven't made a door before. <laughs> but here's the Dutch door. So there's extra hinge, of course. Um, um, yeah, let's look at the frame here. Uh, hold on, I'm gonna turn you around. Um, turn you around. Oh man, I'm just having a heck of a time with this app today. Uh, and YouTube, I don't know who, but here's the door frame. Um, so this, this is the frame. These are the stops. Uh, stops are the, the, parts that the door closes against, but these days, um, the door doesn't hit the stops directly in the edge here. I'm going to crank around so you can see of the stop is, is a little gap 
for a push-in kerf weather stripping, and I think I have a piece of that on the floor. I'll show you how it works. Um, here's this is run of the mill. You can get it in any store. It's a it's kind of like a vinyl bulb with a little flanged fin, and you jam it into the slot. It's not easy to do, but I'm doing it, and um, this creates weather stripping for your door. And so like sometimes I need a tool to kind of shove on it, but but that's the general idea is it's called kerf in weather stripping. <laughs> it's really hard to do this while I'm holding my camera. Um, often we loosen the screws on the stop and then um, finish the kerfing there. But so I'm not gonna keep doing that. I'm gonna pull it back out actually, but that's that's kerf in weather stripping. Then the door shuts against it and creates a seal. And and this stuff is like I said, it's run of the mill, you can find it anywhere. Um, there are actually better versions out there. I'm about to switch up to a silicone version. Um, but this stuff is cool because you can get it anywhere you go. Um, uh, at meaning hardware stores. Um, so let's, uh, let's look at a window. Here's a uh, casement window with a surface divider that I built. Um, this is the Fuchsia house. It's a new design by me. Um, There's a little tiny window. Uh, this is a kitchen window. Um, it's an awning window, which means it opens outward, um, which is really cool. Uh, and we can look at these up close. Let's see if I can pull it open. Um, I use a, a modern design on my windows and put kerf in weather stripping. Let's see if I can get it out. I can't. Yeah, I don't want to break it. Um, in the edge of the window, and it creates a, a kind of a, a wipe seal when the window is shut all the way like that. Um, and that uh, prevents water from entering in the sash area. Uh, so, and this has insulated glass. Um, right now I'm using all insulated low E glass in my designs. Um, it's really, you know, nice uh, technology to have these days. Um, maybe we should look at an insulated glass unit. Um, I'll show you what goes in these windows. Uh, so you can see what it is that, you know, helps you stay warm. Um, I have an insulated glass unit in my office. I'm going to go get it. It's a round one, incidentally. Um, again, shop, shop's a little crazy these days. Uh, but it's just because we're building. <clears throat> Here's one. Okay. So this is an insulated glass unit. Um, well, let me let me get somewhere where I can stand back and show it to you. Um, I'm just gonna set it down here. Um, anyway, that is a round insulated glass unit, and um, what they do is they insert a divider into the glass, and then they, they seal it with a sealant. They often usually fill it with an inert gas, and it, it helps um, prevent condensation. Uh, the spacer that goes in there actually often has a desiccant to help absorb any little bit of water that might have gotten in. Um, so let's see. Um, a question from Squee Squee Squid. Uh, and they are asking, uh, is the window seal expensive to add? Um, no, I, I mean, it's, it's part of the window uh, that I build, so it's, it's kind of incorporated in the cost. Um, I use it in m almost all of my windows. Um, I use it in all my windows, is actually what I meant to say. Um, and uh, most modern windows have a similar seal. So, uh, yeah, that's called a kerf in kerf bulb. I can show you. Ah, I have, here. <laughs> I've got some right here. A lot of it, actually. Here's my roll, my thousand feet of kerf bulb weather stripping. I'm going to find the end so I can show you up close. Um, sorry, that's a little. That's kerf in. This is a special. Uh, or you can't get this at the hardware store. This is um, uh, has it's it's made by um, Schlegel. Um, it's called it's an Aptus profile. 
<laughs> uh, I won't go on. It gets really complicated. They have a million different like profiles of this stuff. Um, but since I'm a window maker, I order it by the bulk and uh, makes good insulation around my or makes good um, seal around my windows, and it lasts a long time because it's really nice material. I think it's EPDM, but I'm not totally sure about that. Uh, so, uh, Cindy K asks, do you consider skylights windows and how do you keep them from leaking? Do you like the skylights that open? Um, skylights aren't really windows. I, can, I, I think a really good way to relate to skylights is to regard them as part of your roof. So, you have to build them in a way that, you know, the, the engineering is, is roof type, not window type. So, window... A window seal facing upward on a roof would not work, basically. It would, it would leak. It wouldn't survive the conditions. Uh, snow piled on top, all, et cetera, et cetera. So a skylight, I don't really see it as equivalent to a window. It is, yeah, there's a piece of glass or acrylic or whatever the, the translucent part is. But other than that, it's actually a part of your roof. So the question, how do you keep them from leaking? Uh, that's a multifaceted question I could spend an entire episode just talking about installing a skylight, but uh, here, I'll show you a skylight unit and I'll talk about the steps that normally happen when I'm putting one in. Um, so let me grab one. <laughs> it's like Christmas. I have a brand new Tam Skylight. This is a family business that there's just, you know, I'm not going to say they're down the road from me, but they're, you know, like 35, 40 minutes away. They're in Seattle, Washington, and um, they build fantastic skylights. So that's part of keeping it from leaking is getting a good quality skylight. Um, there are some decent Velux is, is well known, um, and I think if you do the right thing with those, you can keep them from leaking, but really I prefer the workmanship of these guys and the longevity. So so this is a thick skylight unit. Tip up a little bit. And uh, it's a little one, which is great for tiny houses. And it basically sets over the top of the curb. So, so this is the, you know, roof side. And this sits on um, the curb, which is part of your roof structure. You know what I mean? So anyway, that's a TAM skylight, and I love their work. Uh, they weld these aluminum frames right in their facility, and uh, yeah, they're all assembled here in Seattle. Um, so then the rest of keeping a skylight from leaking is, of course, building a good roof. And roofs have a particular set of kind of steps that you usually take, and um, good roofers are kind of magic <laughs> when it comes down to it, because um, if you do it right, your roof will last for an extremely long time and be easy to maintain. If you do it wrong, well, it leaks, and leaking can damage your entire structure or damage what's in your structure, like your floor and your house. So you kind of got to get your roofs right. Um, so um, keeping skylights from leaking Let's see, how about I will also put a, a, a link on some best practices. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll write them and give them to you guys. Um, I'll put them up later, but I'll put the link to that on, actually I'll just do brief best practices in the description. How about that? It's, it's, it'll be a little wordy, but um, it, it, there's a few rules you can follow. One of them is using a good skylight to start out with. Um, Making your curb high enough is the next one. Uh, and your requirements are going to be different depending on where on the roof the sky is placed. If it's down at the bottom, it's going to receive more rain and snow load than if it was up near the top. So usually they're, tiny houses are little, so it's easier than a bigger house because the rain load coming down the roof is less. Um, and then the third one is getting the flashing right, and that is kind of... Skylights have complicated flashing by nature. So um, they have bigger flashing. It's like wider than other parts of the roof typically. And that is to keep, 
because they act as like a dam. So, you know, like snow and rain and leaves and crap fall on the top edge of a skylight. And if you don't have the flashing extend far enough up or it's not sealed well enough or if it doesn't create a secondary overflash, that flashing can be used in combinations to uh, prevent water running in. So skylight sleek because people don't always get it right. Um, but if they get it right, skylights don't leak. Um, if the unit, the unit um, breaks later or if a seal breaks, then you just replace the, the unit and you're good to go. Um, you can goop them, but typically once a skylight goes, it's a little hard to keep it sealed. So I'll give you guys some information in the description after this goes up. Um, yes, skylights. <laughs> um, but they're wonderful things. Oh, oh and this I will note, in the grand context of talking about windows and doors and skylights, um, skylights are wonderful because they are a part of a roof instead of a, a sidewall. They're more expensive to put in. So the labor is more to get them, like all that flashing doesn't have to happen on windows and doors. I mean, some, the, the drip and the, the weather, you know, the weather stripping does, but it's not as intense as putting something on the roof. So putting in skylights costs money and or time. So um, if you're building it yourself, it's time. If you're hiring somebody to do it, it's um, money. Uh, Cindy K asked, in general, do you like using skylights in your tiny homes? Yeah, totally. I'm a builder. I like using skylights um, with, you know, the caveat that they're more expensive. Um, sometimes, sometimes I appreciate the simplicity of a roof without a bunch of holes punched in it. Um, I think it has the capability to last longer with lower maintenance. So I don't always feel the need to put a skylight in. Um, and sometimes it's just for budgetary reasons, like I can put more windows in for the cost of a skylight. So, you know, um, but some houses kind of need it, especially tiny houses because space is, is at a premium. So, um, let's see, uh, I'm going to take another question. Laura M. I'm totally fascinated by how you go about keeping the structural integrity of the roof rafters, even though the skylight interrupts them. Um, yes, that is part of the science of framing, roof framing. Um, maybe I won't get into that today, but basically you have to, your roof has to be able to support a certain load. And if you cut through the rafters, which is very common when you put in a skylight, you know, if the, the rafters are spaced on 16 inch centers and you put a, a two foot wide skylight in, well, you're gonna cut one rafter. That's no big deal. But if you're putting a six foot skylight in, you may cut several and then you, you have to do something. You have to change the structure to accommodate that. And it's usually done in the initial stages of building um, to add a skylight like that in is complicated. And sometimes you have to take apart a large part of the structure to actually support it. So typically add-in skylights are small. Um, you know, if you remodel and add one later. Um, it's not impossible to add the structure you need. Um, it depends on the house and like, you know, houses that have like rafters and then a ceiling below and trusses and stuff. Uh, you know, you can go up there and add framing and that's typically what people do when they're remodeling. But in a tiny house where it's like lofted, uh, vaulted ceiling, it may be a lot of tearing apart to, to add a large skylight later. So put it in the first time. <laughs> there you go. Um, and Squeak Squeak Squid asked, can you put the name of your skylight family business in the description section? Absolutely. I was planning to put um, some window and door makers that I love. Uh, manufacturers, these are people that you can order from um, throughout uh, North America. I, Simpson might be the West, but um, I'll, I'll check and see how far they ship and I'll, I'll note that. Um, their range. And yes, I'll put the uh, TAM, which is the skylight maker that I know, um, in there. And they do wonderful work. They're a family business um, in Seattle. But they've, um, uh, so they can do like, because of that, you know, you call and you can talk to somebody and they can make you a custom skylight. You can buy directly from them if there's not a dealer near you. Or you can go to a local, there's roofing supplies that carry their, um, their stuff and probably some window companies that also would carry them. Um, so yeah, uh, anyway, so I've been going on for a while and I'll, I'm gonna wrap up. Um, maybe I'll show you this, uh, 
this copper porch lamp that uh, my really good friend and um, amazing artist Travis made. Because I'm totally into it. It's going on the next house. Um, he built this. It's got this uh, hand-blown glass. It's all made of copper. Um, and it'll hang on a, on a, from a bracket off the front entryway of the house. Um, super cool. Oh, look. Socket inside. Alrighty. Genius. Travis is a metal worker, carpenter. Uh, I think he does like leather work and wood carving. You name it. Travis is talented. Um, <clears throat> anybody wants a porch light? Uh, look me up and I'll, I'll uh, give you Travis's number. Um, but um, yeah, he's, he's, he's fantastic. I'm glad that I got that for this next house. It's just uh, the fuchsia. That goes on the fuchsia house. Um, so with, without going on forever about windows and doors, um, or so I don't go on forever about windows and doors, which I could because I have been doing them for years, um, I'll, I'll wrap up. And um, I'm going to go have some something like ham with my kids because it's that day. Um, you know, eggs and ham, I guess, is the theme on the, the, the day named Easter um, in North America, anyway. And so uh, I hope you guys have a lovely weekend, and um, I hope the weather is as beautiful as it is here. We've got this, like, filtered sunlight and, um, you know, dandelions opening everywhere. Uh, and come visit me next time, uh, next week. Um, and I, what I'm going to do from here on out, I think it'll be a little easier for me, a little easier for the East Coast crowd, is I'm moving up to 9.30 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. Um, so, yeah, join me at Ask Still Live. Um, in the meanwhile, uh, you can watch back, back issues, so to speak, on my YouTube channel um, and subscribe if you want to get the notifications of them. So um, next, uh, next weekend, I will be most likely in California. So um, I don't know if I'll do a broadcast from there, um, but if I can, I will. Um, I, I'm delivering a tiny house. I'm visiting another one of mine. Uh, it's going to be fun. Um, all right. See you guys next time, and uh, cheers.